Before I start, I need to let you know that I have absolutely no commercial interest in any of the, product com the companies and the products that I'm going to talk about today. So um, that's really important that I have abs um, I'm not receiving any money from any of the companies that make the products that I've been studying in my lab. The reason why this is so important is because for a long time, particularly in the drug industry, um, the companies have been funding the research and what we've learned over the last couple of decades is that that creates a conflict of interest and a bias in reporting in the scientific lit literature that we're really only starting to appreciate right now and we're going to probably spend a decade unraveling this and trying to figure out well what is actually the evidence base for a lot of the treatments that we use. So for something new like using micronutrients for the treatment of mental illness, it's really, really important that we start a fresh page and that we do it in a way that, is, has, that we're limiting the, the, the level of conflicts uh, between the researchers and the people who make these products. But another disclaimer that I want to make is that while I am going to spend the hour mostly talking about nutrition and nutrients, I do want to make it clear that I'm not saying that nutrients and nutrition alone is going to cure and treat all mental illness. Um, oftentimes I'll get that question at the end and say, well, well hold on, what about poverty or what about um, abuse or other environmental issues? Of course they are very, very important and I don't want to minimize the importance of other risk factors to the development and also in terms of treatment of mental illness. So I just wanted to make that clear that I do recognize the importance of other issues as well. I'm going to start with a story. In 1847, there was a physician named Ignaz Semmelweis who advised that all physicians should wash their hands before touching pregnant women in order to prevent childbed fever. His research showed that you could reduce the mortality rates from septicemia from 18% down to 2% simply through washing your hands with chlorinated lime. His medical colleagues, though, refused to accept that they themselves were responsible for spreading infection. Semmelweis was ridiculed by his peers. He was dismissed. And the criticism and backlash broke him down. And he was actually confined to an asylum where he died there two weeks later from septicemia at the age of 47. What I am going to talk about today may sound as radical as hand washing sounded to a mid 19th century doctor and yet it is equally scientific. It's the simple idea that optimizing nutrition is a safe and viable way to avoid, treat and lessen mental illness. I just want to get an idea of the extent uh, that mental illness is affecting our community. So if you could just uh, show a hand, show of hands for those of you who know someone, a friend or a family member, who suffers from a mental illness. Yeah. Okay. A show of hands for those of you who feel that the treatment that that person is currently receiving is not working as well as you'd like it to. Okay. So just, just hold, hold your hands up for those of you, okay, so you don't feel that the treatment is working. Look around, just in terms of just getting an idea of the extent that our community doesn't feel that the treatments that we're currently using are not working. And that's really, really important and something that's become incredibly personal for me because I receive daily emails from the public around the world telling me about their stories of their family members being treated with conventional treatments, being on medicated with one medication after another, and yet they still suffer. And that's a message that I feel that I need to get out and that we need to start thinking about as a community and start grappling with the very challenging but real problem is that not everyone is responding to the treatments that we're currently providing. At the moment, one in five New Zealanders suffer from a mental illness. 
According to the New Zealand Health Survey 2013, the rates of psychiatric illness in children doubled in the last five years. Internationally, in the last two decades, there's been a threefold increase in ADHD, a 20-fold increase in autism, and a 40-fold increase in bipolar disorder in children. The rates of mental illness in our community are actually on the rise. And this graph here shows the increasing rates or the increasing number of people on disability as a direct consequence of an underlying psychiatric condition from 1991 through to 2009. Now, I give you this uh, local data, but I could show you this same graph and this same rise in the number of people on disability as a direct consequence of an underlying psychiatric illness across the world. We have data, the same types of data, the US, Denmark, other Scandinavian countries, the UK, etc. The pattern is the same. Some people might say this was labor government, <laughs> but we can't claim that for all the countries. So how are we currently dealing with this problem? Well, currently, our, medical, our, our healthcare system operates within a medical model. And so what you would typically be offered first would be medications, followed by psychological therapies and other forms of support. And our reliance on medications as a frontline form of treatment is evident from the increasing rates of prescriptions. So I got some data from Pharma. You can get this. You can. Um, Pharmac, sorry. Um, you can get this uh, on, online. This is all available. And so what you see here is the green line. This one is the scripts for new antidepressants going rising up from 1993 through to January 2014. This purple line here is showing you the old antidepressants. So, old, so the, the older ones, we, we get new generation antidepressants, and so people will change their, their um, practices and start to prescribe those. But there's actually no real change in those scripts. All that's happened is that we're starting to, to use the newer um, antidepressants much more. Um, just around the uh, 2000 here, they started to rise even higher. And this is just giving you the cost. When the cost goes down, that's usually because a medication has come off patent. And that's why it suddenly becomes a little bit cheaper for, for Pharmac to, to purchase. And this one here surpri surprised me when I looked at it. But this is the prescriptions for antipsychotics. Again, we have the old generation antipsychotics going down a little bit, but still maintaining itself at 1,000 scripts um, in, in January uh, 2014. But here we've got the new an antipsychotics rising really quite, quite dramatically, and then the cost dropping suddenly here in 2011 because of some of the um, newer antipsychotics coming off of patent. So we are increasingly relying on medications as a frontline way of dealing with psychiatric problems. Given that this is our frontline way of treating, and in fact is the predominant uh, way of, of dealing with mental illness in all Western societies, you would rightfully expect that it was working well. And indeed, in some cases, these treatments save lives. And I'm not here to dismiss them altogether. But if a medication or a treatment was truly working, then shouldn't the rates of disorder and disability as a direct consequence of that underlying illness be decreasing rather than increasing. And that's why we actually need to consider the role that the medications themselves might be playing in the long-term outcome for some people and in these poor long-term outcomes. And some of the data that I'm gonna share with you right now may be a bit surprising for some people because it's not typically what you would hear um, in our community. If we take any class of medications, antidepressants, anxiolytics, antipsychotics, stimulants, the pattern is the same. In the short term, you often see great benefit, but in the long term, too often you don't. And in some cases, it's, it's making life worse. So I'm gonna take stimulants first. 
This study, the MTA study, is actually one of the largest studies that has ever been done on children with ADHD. They took 579 children and they randomized them to four groups. Medication, medication plus behavior therapy, behavior therapy, or treatment as usual. And after 14 months, the stimulants trumped. The stimulants were found to be the best way to treat these children with ADHD, and it gave people great confidence that we should continue to use these medications as the frontline form of treating ADHD. But what hasn't been spoken about as much in the media is the three-year data, the six-year data, and the eight-year data. And they paint a very different story. And that is that medication is not associated with good long-term outcome. In fact, it's associated with deterioration in symptoms. People, the children who were, medica who were medicated in the long term were actually doing more poorly than the children who were never medicated. How often is that told to families who have children with ADHD who are prescribed these medications? And there are other studies that show this same bleak picture. This study looks at antidepressants. This was published by Roger Mulder. He's a professor of, psych um, of psychiatry at the University of Chicago. Chris Frampton's a statistician. And they looked at how were people, the people with depression doing over the last 50 years and compared them to 50 years uh, prior to the use of antidepressants. And what they found was that the relapse, despite our ever-increasing reliance on antidepressants, the relapse rates and recovery rates are no better now than they were 50 years ago prior to the advent of medications. Antipsychotic, oh actually this is another one on, on antidepressants. This study showed that adolescents with depression treated with antidepressants are three times more likely to convert to bipolar disorder than adolescents with depression not treated with these drugs. This study looks at antipsychotics. It was, stu it was a, a, a study that was published last year in JAMA, and what they found was that people with schizophrenia who had been randomized to stay on their drugs, to stay on their, their medication, were less likely to recover than people who had been randomized to a dose reduction or complete elimination of their drug at seven years. And this was a long-term uh, study that looked at people with schizophrenia over a 20-year period. This was not a randomized trial. It looked at people naturalistically. People who had decided to stay, who stayed on their medication show that they have a much higher rate of psychotic activity at 20 years than the people here who had come off of their medication. These people here who came off their medication were more likely to recover. And I can show you more and more studies, all painting this same bleak picture. So look, this is what we typically think, is that the drug benefit outweighs the side effects and withdrawal. And what I've shown you there, that maybe the drug benefit isn't as strong as we think. Now, if we look at the other side and we think about side effects and withdrawal, what we're finding now is that there's a lot, there's a lot of people reporting a huge number of side effects being on medications. This one looks at antidepressants, finding 62% in their study. This was a John Reed study, came from the University of Auckland. 62% had sexual difficulties, 60% reported feeling emotionally numb on, anti on, on antidepressants, 42% reported a reduction in positive feelings, 39% caring less about others, 39% on antidepressants reporting suicidality, 55% reporting struggles of coming off and experiencing withdrawal, and 27% reporting that, that they were feeling addicted to the drugs. This is another study that looked at side effects and, report, and showing um, other side effects associated with medications. But I just wanted to highlight one, one specific symptom, and this is sexual difficulties. People may not know that there's actually a high reporting of sexual difficulties when on antidepressants. 
This, number, this, this is showing placebo. The about 10% of people on placebo report uh, experience sexual dysfunction versus about 70 to 80% on medications. And these are the different antidepressants, fluoxetine, paroxetine, um, venlafaxine, et cetera. So 70 to 80% of people on an antidepressant are going to experience sexual difficulties. How many people in our public and our society know about this data? If you're taking antidepressants during pregnancy, there's a 30% chance of, of your, your um, child or the, 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 the fetus um, experiencing challenging problems on, at birth. Things like high-pitched cries, sleep disturbance, tremors, gastrointestinal disturbances, hypertonicity, and tachypnea. And then finally, before I switch to nutrients, I just want to mention a study that came out quite a number of years ago and got a lot of press. This was Irving Kirsch. And what he did was that he looked at all the studies that had been done on antidepressants and actually determined that 82% of the effect of antidepressants was completely caused by the placebo effect. And that it's a very small additional of two points on a, on a the, what's called the HAMD. It's a, a rating scale, of a, clinical, a clinician um, scale used to rate depression. There was only a two-point difference between the those people who have been on antidepressants versus those people who have been on placebo. So the additional benefit of the antidepressant is very, very small. And what we actually know now is that the people who benefit the most are the ones who are very severely depressed, and that there's virtually no difference whatsoever between placebo and antidepressants in people who are suffering mild to moderate depression. So when we look at this with this this balance, and we think, okay, well, sometimes there, you know, we, we take them, we appreciate that there are risks associated with medications, but the drug benefits outweigh those risks. I would suggest that maybe there's some other that the drug benefit is not as strong as we think it is, and that maybe the side effects are higher than um, than we're aware of. And then finally, I want to alert you to an issue, which is um, publication bias which means that a lot of studies that are negative are not are negative on medications are not even being published. So this was, um, this uh, these, these data were, were in, bad, uh, in Ben Goldacre's book, Bad Farmer, where he looked at uh, the antidepressants and looked to see what, had been, what was put, into, put forward to the FDA in order to get approval for the medication versus what was um, actually published. And so what we find is that 33 of the negative trials were unpublished, 37 of the positive trials were published. This means that 97% of the positive trials were published versus 8% of the negative trials. So when we think about evidence-based medicine and what our medical practitioners are using to make decisions for our health care in the world of mental health, they're actually, it's ba their decisions are based on a biased sample because a lot of the negative trials are never making it to the public. So what are we going to do about this? <laughs> Pretty depressing. <laughs> All right. So. Maybe it's time to revisit a really old idea, and that is that nutrition may be relevant to our health and to our mental health. Let food be thy medicine, and let thy medicine be food. Hippocrates, this is a famous quote. We all know it. We've heard it. And I'm suggesting that we revisit this idea. So. Almost two decades ago, my PhD supervisor, Professor Bonnie Kaplan, told me about some families who were from southern Alberta, Canada, on a nice day. <laughs> Beautiful day. It's often very cold there. Southern Alberta, Canada, um, about some families who were treating themselves with nutrients. Now, members of these families had serious mental health issues bipolar disorder, psychosis, depression. And 
My training in clinical psychology had actually taught me that nutrition and diet were of trivial significance in the treatment of mental illness and that only medications or psychotherapy could treat these serious problems. But she and others published preliminary data in the earlier part of this century showing people getting well on nutrients and staying well. And so I decided to take a plunge, change the direction of my research, and start studying the nutrients for the treatment of mental illness. And that's what I've done now for close to a decade. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to share some of my data from my lab, the Mental Health and Nutrition Research Group at the University of Canterbury, and share what some of the findings that, that um, we've been publishing over the last few years. In 2009, I got funded uh, some, some private fund, um, funding from, a, from a, uh, the Vic Davis Memorial Trust, actually, uh, in the North Island, and a private donation to run a randomized control trial. This is where you, it's the gold standard design, it's called an RCT, to um, look at the effects of nutrients on adults with ADHD. And so we randomized half to the micronutrients and half to the placebo. And what we found was that um, twice as many people responded in the micronutrient group compared to the placebo group. There was the, the, the hyperactivity and impulsivity dropped into the normal non-clinical range for those taking the micronutrients. Depression, twice as many, those people who entered the trial depressed, twice as many people went into remission in their depression when on the micronutrients compared to placebo. And people who were on the micronutrients were more likely to report that they were um, having better experiences in terms of their overall functioning and having better relationships and um, better functioning at work. We also followed this group up long term. And what this data is showing is this is, uh, these are all T-scores. And these two up here, that means you're in the above the 99th percentile in your ADHD symptoms. So they ca the, uh, what I've done here is divided the groups into what they did at one year. So they either stay on their micronutrients by choice, they either decide to come off of the micronutrients, or they choose to switch to medications. And what we found was that the people who stayed on the micronutrients stayed well. That's this yellow line here. People who decided to stop their micronutrients showed a reversal in their symptoms. But even those people who switched to medications didn't do any better than they were before um, when they were on the micronutrients. And certainly those who stayed on the medications were functioning the best at, in their ADHD symptoms anyway compared to the other two groups. And even I mean, one thing that we note here is that those who switched to medications were a group who didn't respond as much to the micronutrients as these other two groups. Um, but even when we control for that, um, diff that group difference, the group who stayed on the micronutrients was still functioning much better. And within the normal range, this a T-score of 55, um, this average is within the, falling within the normal range. We've since... Uh, now, after that study came out, we've been, we've been looking at uh, trying to replicate it with children. And so a PhD student of mine, Heather Gordon, uh, looked at, lo at the feasibility of using the micronutrients with children with ADHD. And so it was a small pilot trial for her PhD. And what she did was that she took 14 children with ADHD, but followed them for a very long period of time on the micronutrients for eight weeks, we took them off for four weeks, we put them back on the micronutrients for eight weeks, and then we took them off for another four weeks. And so this data here is showing this on-off, on-off control of symptoms. This is the kids at baseline, very high level of symptoms of ADHD, drops under the clinical line here at, um, after eight weeks on the nutrients. They reverse back up here to the, not quite to baseline, but certainly back into the clinical range when they're off them, and then they go back the average 
falls back into the normal range um, on the nutrients and then we see another reversal off. So we have a really nice ABAB type of design showing the, the potential benefit of using the micronutrients for children. And we are now currently running, as a consequence of this data, we are running a randomized control trial using micronutrients to treat ADHD in children where we're comparing the micronutrients to placebo. Oh yes, good. No, that's not a that's not a, t a terrible question. That's a good question. A T score is so a 50 is um, would be what we call a normal would be the average population average number of you know, if you took a group of a thousand people they would fall at a, a T score of about 50 plus or minus one standard deviation which is 10. So that's 60. So when you hit this, the line, that's where we say this is kind of a cutoff of where if you're falling above that line, we would normally say that's clinically relevant, that they're ex displaying symptoms much more than your typical individual in, a, in the population. So when you have a T-score of 80 up here at eight, almost 85 or about 82, that's above the 99th percentile. So if you think about that, that um, in terms of uh, you know, height or weight, they would be somebody who's like, you know, six foot or I don't know what the 99th percentile is in height. But it's a good analogy in that if you see this drop, the drop particularly down to here, that's a drop of three standard, devi almost three standard deviations, which would be equivalent to a drop in height of about a foot. So not quite a foot, but that's quite a substantial, you would notice that if somebody walked in <laughs> and they dropped by a foot, you would notice that. When these kids get well, we actually notice it. This isn't typically a small effect. For some people it is. If for some of the children it definitely is in the sense that um, they only have a mild benefit. Some kids show no benefit whatsoever. It's a fairly small number of them. But as, and certainly a, 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 good a, a good number of them are showing quite a substantial change in their symptoms. You. Does that we were giving participants up to 15 pills a day, 36 ingredients. So that's five pills three times a day. So it's unlikely that if you listen to my talk and you think you're gonna go out and get a one a day at the supermarket and replicate what we've shown, um, you're unlikely both because the dose is gonna be a lot smaller and the breadth of nutrients in the one a days is much smaller as well. And I just want to point out, I have a few, couple of graphs from, uh, which was a, a collaboration with Ian Shaw and a, and a graduate student, Amy Harris, where we looked at the doses of the, uh, those supplements that had been studied in research, and we compared it to the dose of of the over-the-counter supplements, and this was for, for children. So these are nutrient, um, this was uh, looking at vi vitamin B1 in particular, and the daily dose that had been used for vitamin B1 in the uh, research studies, you can see, you don't need a statistic to see that this is substantially larger than the dose here in the over-the-counter supplements. And I just show you the same thing with B6, B12. So it's important to recognize this issue of dose and I'm going to come back to this later when I talk about safety and is it safe to use uh, doses as high as what we were being using in the research. So there are other studies that um, we've, we've published over the, time, over the last few years as well. This one looked at uh, children with bipolar disorder, 120 children, and, and looked at how they were doing in their symptoms when taking micronutrients um, o over the six month period. And what we found was that there was a reduction of about half in that, um, a reduction of about half of, in the average of the symptoms for these children and that, um, that uh, this, was, uh, this came alongside a reduction in the use of medications as well. So e their, their symptoms benefited and reduced over the time and simultaneously, they were also able to get away with a much lower dose of medications. The, the earthquake. After the September, let me get, just to give you a bit of uh, background to this. After the September earthquake, uh, 
I was actually, I mean, many people, uh, you know, were able to continue with their work, and, and, their, and depending on where you lived in the, in, in the city, your house was okay. And so after the September earthquake, I was in a fortune position of being able to continue with my work. And, but the university was actually closed for a week, and so I thought, what can I do? You know, what, this is, I've heard of this, where people, um, researchers are in this situation where they're carrying out research, and then suddenly a bit, there's a big event, what, what can I look at in my work that might be helpful or interesting based on having this, this, this large event occur in the city? And so I, what I was able to do was to, to, to look at the trials that were going on in my lab and determine whether or not the people who happened to be taking micronutrients at the time, time of the September earthquake, if they recovered more quickly in terms of their stress or anxiety compared to people who happened to not be taking micronutrients at the time of the earthquake, just because of where they were enrolled in a study. Some people might have not started or they, they might have finished and they decided to stop their nutrients. So we found, um, so I and alongside my graduate students, we phoned uh, all, all the people in our database to find out how they were doing. And what we found was that the people who happened to be taking the micronutrients at the time of the earthquake recovered much more quickly than the people who were not taking micronutrients at the time of the earthquake. So when the February earthquake came, and my situation was much worse, my house was really badly damaged, I was out of it for three months, as every, some people might know who work here at the university, it, the university was, was, was not closed for business, it was open for business, but we were all intense and we weren't allowed back into, I, I wasn't, we weren't allowed back into the Department of Psychology for three months, and I was living in a house here on campus. And I kind of, I was squatting, oh, I should turn that off. I was squatting in the house. I was, the university was keen to get me out of the house, so I thought, I've got to make it really, really useful. So, I know I was saying this on camera and everything. I've got to make myself really useful. So we ran the clinical psychology department from one room, and I ran a research study from the other room. And the research study that we ran was to look to see whether or not we could replicate those findings from the September earthquake. And that was that we, but we wanted to take the general population, can we help the general population with the stress and anxiety associated with the earthquake? So we randomized people to three, to three different doses of nutrients. And we also had a, a, what was a non-randomized control group to see whether, th that we could compare those who've gone on to the micronutrients to see whether or not there was a difference in terms of their ability to the, reduce their stress and anxiety. So the, the data I'm going to show here is just looking at the three different c conditions. We used Baraka, an, another product, Empire Plus, that we've been studying in our lab with four pills and Empire Plus at eight pills a day, and then a control group. This is just looking at the rates of po probable post-traumatic stress disorder. What we found collectively was that anyone who was on the micronutrients did really well. In fact, looking at those groups as a whole, there was a d reduction from 65% down to 19% in probable post-traumatic stress disorder with a one-month intervention with micronutrients with the control group showing absolutely no change in their symptoms. There was, um, in terms of the, be you know, was one better than the other, they were all really, really good, but the, there were larger effects associated with the um, nutrients where there was a broader base of minerals, um, and there was a preference later to stay on the, the broader-based supplement compared to Baraka. But I, I would say, if you're ever in another natural disaster, I, I'd highly recommend B to, even the B vitamins as a good way forward to help you cope with the stress associated with the, the, the event. And the reason, I, what's that? <laughs> I don't know, I'd love to, I could do that study next. <laughs> insurance companies, good idea. Um, we have since, oh, actually I wanted to also show that it was protective in the long term. We followed up these groups at one year and we found that those people who had um, been randomized, uh, sorry, had taken the micronutrients just in the acute period, so for four weeks, they were um, doing much better at one year than the group of people who had, had not been taking micronutrients um, at all in the, that four week earlier period. So they were still doing better. So we, hopefully we, it was protective in the long term. 
And the other interesting thing that we were able to do with the long-term data was to see whether or not people who had stayed on micronutrients, how did they compare to people who had switched to medications? And what we found was that, again, just like with the long-term data for the ADHD study, was that the people who had stayed on the micronutrients were doing better than the people who had switched to medications. I do need to say here, though, that it's a naturalistic study. So we don't know what happens between in this period. It might be that the people who switched to medications had a lot more stressors or other events that might explain why they didn't recover as well as the people who had stayed on the micronutrients. Maybe the people with micronutrients were doing other things like exercise or other lifestyle changes that might explain these group differences. So it's really important that you understand that it may not be necessarily the micronutrients that led to these group differences. I was in Tokyo in 2000, June 2013 when the floods in Alberta hit. Now, I've, I'm, my, my in-laws are from Calgary, and so I was really um, aware of how devastating it was when this, there was a sudden rise in, in water levels in the rivers and the flooding that occurred um, in, the, in, southern, in, in southern Alberta. So I contacted... Uh, Bonnie Kaplan at the University of Calgary and said we can replicate our earthquake study here and we can see whether or not uh, just giving nutrients to a population who are going to be stressed can help them recover. And we, so that's what we did. So we replicated the earthquake study but there were a bit of differences in the design in that we didn't use, we used a vitamin D as a control group. So people were either randomized to vitamin D, a B complex, or broad spectrum formula. And again, we found this really substantial reduction in stress in those people who were randomized to the B complex or broad spectrum formula with very little change in those taking the vitamin D. So the message to me is clear. A well-nourished body and brain is better able to withstand ongoing stress and recover from mental illness. Giving nutrients during a period of high stress is a really good public health intervention to help a population following a natural disaster. If you want to think about it like a triage system, is that when we are really stressed, nutrients are going to be shut shuttled to the fight-flight response, and they'll be less available for the rest of your body and your brain to function. And so that giving nutrients at a time of high stress is a good way to ensure that all of your body, your body functions can operate to the optimal. So I've, t I've talked about studies that have been in my lab and things that I've done in terms of collaboration with others. But internationally, there are now over 20 randomized control trials, the gold standard that we use to make uh, clinical decisions, showing the benefits of micronutrients in reducing aggression in prisoners, slowing cognitive decline in the elderly, assisting people with addictions, and helping people recover from depression, anxiety, stress, and ADHD. There are some negative trials, that is where they find no effect of micronutrients, but it's important to know that the trials that have found no effect actually studied people who had no psychiatric symptoms to begin with. They used healthy populations. So, I know it's amazing, isn't it? You'd never do that with antidepressants. But people do this. Um, all of the studies that have been done on psychiatric symptoms have shown benefit of nutrients. It's, it, this this, this um, way forward, the using micronutrients, may in some cases be more cost effective than our current treatment approach. This study here, um, done by Megan Rodways, who is, a psych who is a psychiatrist at the Alberta Children's Hospital, she reported on a 10-year-old boy with psychosis. Now, he presented in the inpatient unit with hallucinations, delusions, 
um, and obsessive compulsive symptoms. And he was one of the worst cases that they had ever had in the inpatient unit. Nothing worked. And he was in there for six months, tried on a whole bunch of different medications, and then released in this very same condition that he came into the inpatient unit, and that his mother had to quit her job in order to look after him long term. They heard about the nutrients, and they decided that they wanted to try them. And they suggested that to Megan Rodway, who said, well, it's snake oil, but I have nothing else to offer. And so he switched, and within six months, all his hallucinations, delusions, and obsessive compulsive symptoms had completely gone. And he just graduated successfully from high school, still on the nutrients, still doing well, um, seven years later. What's relevant here is the cost. The cost of the micronutrients was less than 2% of the cost of the inpatient unit stay. So the cost saving alone makes it imperative that our society pay attention, pay attention to the broader benefits of, and potential of this approach. And there is more good news. This study uh, randomized people, at, adolescents at risk for psychosis to receiving either omega-3 fatty acids or fish, um, omega-3 fatty acids in the form of fish oils or placebo for a 12-week period. One year later, 40%, whoops, hold on, no, not 40%, 28% um, of those who had been put on the placebo converted to pl um, psychosis versus only 5% of those on the fish oils. This represents an 80% reduction in the chance of developing psychosis simply through using fish oils. So I just wanted to comment quickly on an issue about whether or not we should be using single or multiple nutrients. Oftentimes people will think, well, we should just give zinc, or we should give v vitamin B, um, D, or we should give iron. And what's important is to consider that this is probably the wrong approach. And all I've got here is just the pathways to making serotonin, which we, we know is an important neurotransmitter for brain function. And all the nutrients that are required to, um, to, opt, um, to make the serotonin, it's not just one nutrient. They're needed in combination. So to, taking one single nutrient is, likely to, is unlikely to have the beneficial effect that I've been talking about. And it's also unlikely that we would get the benefit out of um, this diet here. If we look at deficiencies that are actually present in the population, and we think about the multiple deficiencies that are present um, across the a broad range of nutrients, if we think about this like a dam, if we only address one deficiency, then all we're going to do is we're going to create a deficiency somewhere else. So I'm actually arguing that doing single nutrients is probably the wrong approach to treating mental illness and that we need to take a broad array of nutrients in order to maximize the benefit. So you might be thinking, why don't we just tell everyone to eat better? I've been talking about nutrients supplementing. Why don't we just change our diet? And indeed, there are now 11 epidemiological studies, both cross-sectionally and longitudinally, from around the world that are all showing the same thing. That eating a Mediterranean or prudent type of diet lowers your risk for depression. And that eating a Western diet increases the risk for depression. If we look at pregnancy and early nutrition, women who are malnourished in pregnancy have a higher risk of producing offspring who develop schizophrenia and depression. Eating the Western diet during pregnancy and or low adherence to a Mediterranean or prudent diet increases the risk of the offspring developing depression, anxiety, and behavioral problems. And children malnourished in the first years of life have a greater risk for developing depression, ADHD, and personality problems 30 to 40 years later. 
And I just want to touch on the consumption of dyes because the consumption of dyes over time has increased dramatically from 1950 to 2010. A, a, a exponent, almost exponential growth in the consumption of dyes in our, um, and dyes present in our food. There's been a lot of research to see whether or not it's linked to behavioral problems in particular in children. And there is a link. It's not as large as we'd expect it to be, but it is something that we should probably be paying attention to. And this is a meta-analysis. This is where we take a whole bunch of different studies that have looked at this effect and if it's zero, there's absolutely no effect. And the more they're falling over here, the, we know that the food colors are harmful. And the more they're falling over here is that the food colors are helpful. And this, star, this diamond here shows the overall effect across all of these studies. And so we, what we are finding is a small but important effect that is likely affecting about 8% of children. But if you think of the millions of children who are diagnosed with ADHD, that's actually uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of children whose ADHD is primarily caused by food dyes. And it's, as the authors of the study said, the effect is too substantial to dismiss. So what is the Western diet? For those of you who don't know, it's a diet that is high in sugary drinks, refined grains, um, takeaway, and low in fresh produce. It's depleted of vitamins and minerals. And the Mediterranean diet is one that is fresh, high in fruits and vegetables, nuts, healthy fats, fish, and low in processed foods. It's got more, it's nutrient dense. It's got more vitamins and minerals. It's what your grandmother would recognize as food. I just want to touch, as I, I'm going to start closing my talk down here, but there's just a few things that I want to touch on. One of them, as I raised earlier, was micronutrient safety. A lot of people get concerned when we take um, nutrients in a dose that's higher than RDA. And I just want to know that you let you know that what's more relevant is the UL, which is the upper limit. And that's the limit that identifies toxicity. And all our studies are working within this area, which means that we are giving the nutrients higher than RDA, but under the upper limit. In our studies, we're looking at side effects. They're minor and transitory. We actually can get people to be compliant with taking 15 pills a day remarkably well. We've been looking at blood impact, and there's, there's virtually none. In fact, we see a lack of difference in fasting glucose, lipids, white blood cell count, neutrophils, a slight elevation in prolactin, but not in two. The, it's still within the normal range. But the long-term effects, we do need to continue to study, and we need to study them properly. Ultimately, there are some people who cannot tolerate nutrients. People, for example, with Wilson's disease cannot metabolize copper, so you wouldn't want to give them a supplement that has copper in it. And so we do need to be always considering the risks and benefits associated with, with a, this type of treatment approach. But even though you hear a lot of studies in the stories in the media about how vitamins are killing us, I just wanted to point something out. This is the risk. This is societal versus individual risk of death in Australia. And here's complementary medicine, which is a dot too small to print. That's where the vitamins and minerals fall. It's down here. And I just want to point out the elephant in the room, that when we see the big the studies saying that vitamins and minerals are killing us, Let's not forget about preventable um, injury in hospitals or preventable pharmaceutical adverse events in hospitals or going to war, et cetera. The risk of vitamins and minerals in comparison to these other things is actually quite small. A lot of people ask me, what nutrients should I buy? And I haven't really named a lot of the products that, uh, that today, but I do want to mention the ones that have been studied. And so, in fact, most of the things that are on the supermarket shelves have not been studied for mental health symptoms. These are the only ones, in my, to my knowledge, that have any research to support them in the treatment of any mental health um, symptoms. So the, the one that we've studied the most is Empower Plus. 
Um, but we're also studying uh, the sort of a newer version of it, which is called Daily Essential Nutrients. There's also another product um, called Empower Plus Advanced that we use. Um, we, we, I've studied uh, Baraka. Um, our flood study, the B vitamin complex that we used in the flood study, oh, it was not that one, sorry, was this one over here, B complex made by Douglas Labs. We've studied the daily self-defense in my lab, and then these other, this was Max Stress, was used in um, one of the stress studies, and that, this is another good st uh, one for stress, Blackmore's. Uh, Force of all, was used in the prison studies, um, and then these, this spectrum support and this one here, Autumn Nutrition Research Center, making the ANFIC essential um, capsules is used for the treatment of autism. And this is another one for stress. So stress, st the, the number of studies that have been done, on, are randomized controlled trials that have been done on stress, is large enough for us to say it's good, there's good evidence here that we could. Use, it's a good way forward in terms of reduction of stress. So in terms of the future, I'm interested in genetics. I'm interested in understanding who might need additional nutrients than what we can get out of our food. Are there some people who may be genetically vulnerable such that when the, as the nutrient quality of our food decreases, they express illness? What effect does the gut have on the absorption of nutrients? It's not we are what we eat, it's we are what we absorb. What effect do pesticides have on the nutrient content of our food? Pesticides are now being shown to leach the, the plant of essential nutrients such that its nutrient, uh, the, the nutrient content of the plants is actually going down. It's also going down because of farming practices and that we're not remineralizing re the soil properly. What ro the role do medications play? Combining medications and the micronutrients is actually complicated, and we do need a lot more research to support, to, to learn about the combination of medications and micronutrients. But ultimately, what would the long-term outcome of mental illness be if nutrients and nutri nutrition was our medicine? I think with the data that I've shown today, showing the risk of the Western diet in terms of increasing mental health problems. One thing I didn't say there was that there isn't a single study that shows that the Western diet is good for our mental health. Then the strength of the prudent, healthy diet in protecting us from long-term mental health issues in combination with the studies that I shared with you about nutrients and using nutrients to, try to, to um, treat mental illness suggests that maybe what the way forward is that we consider lifestyle factors diet, exercise, supplements, and therapy for the treat and psychotherapy for the treatment of mental illness and save medications from when these treatments don't work. If nutrients work, shouldn't they be covered by our mental, our healthcare system? We need to nourish the people who are vulnerable. When it comes to risks for cardio, trying to reduce the uh, risk of having cardiovascular events, we know that it's important to address lifestyle factors and diet. It's no different for mental health. Nutrient depleted mothers produce nutrient depleted children. An easy way to address sort of at universally and address the, the problems of mental illness would be to ensure that pregnant women are well nourished. We need to consider the risks of eating cheap processed food. As Michael Pollan stated, cheap food is an illusion. There is no such thing as cheap food. The price is paid somewhere. And if it's not paid at the cash register, then it's charged to the environment and to the public purse in the form of subsidies, and it's charged to your health. Should we think about um, policy changes? In order to reduce cigarette smoking, used to be well advertised as being something that was um, desirable, 
to something that kills us. It was a public health, it was a public health intervention to try to reduce the number of people who quit smoking. So should we address the poor nutrition as a public health intervention? Should we get governments involved in trying to increase the nutrient quality of the food that our entire population is eating? And ultimately, I think we also really need to intervene with our children. Too often, our children are rewarded with processed foods for good behavior. We need to rethink the pairing of processed foods for good behavior. It doesn't intuitively actually make sense. Schools could rethink the quality of their lunch menus. But ultimately, we hold a responsibility to teach our children that every time we put something in our mouths, we make a choice to offer ourselves something nourishing or nutritionally depleted. In the 1600s, they learned that through randomized trials, that putting limes aboard ships completely eliminated the 40% death rate from scurvy when people were sent out on long voyages. But it took 264 years for the British government to mandate that all ships must carry citrus for their sailors. How long will our society take to pay attention to the research that shows that suboptimal nutrition might be contributing to the poor outcome for some people with mental illness. When Ignis Semmelweis advised that, that physicians should wash their hands before touching pregnant women, before delivering babies, he was ridiculed. We are now asking physicians to consider whether the medications that they're prescribing might be contributing to the poor long-term outcome of some people with mental illness. But optimizing nutrition could be a safe and viable way forward. And I leave you with this quote. Only puny secrets need protection. Big discoveries are protected by public incredulity. So in conclusion, it physiologically, it makes sense to provide the body and the brain with nutrients to optimize functioning. If it can't be achieved through diet manipulation alone, then additional nutrients may be required. But we do need more studies. We are in early days in using the nutrients to treat mental illness. We do need more evidence. We need more randomized control trials. But the preliminary studies are showing that broad spectrum micronutrients may be a viable way forward for some people. And on a personal note, a lot of my research is funded on a shoestring budget. So I want to thank my funders, the University of Canterbury, the Vic Davis Memorial Trust, private donation from anonymous donors, um, early career awards, Gravita, and the companies that have provided the nutrients to us for free alongside a placebo um, so that we could run our trials. And then all the wonderful people, my graduate students and collaborators around the world who have really helped with, um, with this work. Thank you.